Hi everyone, welcome to 2CM4, McMaster Engineering Physics Computational Multiphysics class. Uh, this is the first lecture of the series. Today I'm going to be talking about a broad scale overview of what ComSol Multiphysics is, how we're going to be doing computational multiphysics, and the general structure of the, the tool itself. Uh, we'll do a deeper dive into some of the different modules and components in later videos. So let's jump in. ComSol is a tool for solving differential equations over a domain. So at this point, we should all be familiar with what a differential equation is. And of course, we want to be able to solve it. The problem is that we don't, we don't always, we aren't always able to find an analytical solution. It's, it's honestly, it's the best thing always to find an analytical solution if you can, because that is the general solution for all cases. A lot of situations, especially with complex geometries, that's simply not possible. So instead, what we want to use is numerical tools. Uh, and ComSol is one of the methods. It is generally, we can find highly accurate solutions, and more importantly, we can parameterize the accuracy so we can get better or worse depending on our requirements. We can change material properties, we can add more details, but at the same time, do be aware of the adage that garbage in, garbage out. If you put in bad material properties, you're gonna get a bad uh, solution, and it won't necessarily have much meaning at all, other than, uh, other than just flowing through what's gonna be happening to your system. They can also be very computationally intensive. And by very, I mean weeks on some high performance computing clusters. We won't be dealing with those in particular, but just do be aware that for a lot of applications, fast and simple is oftentimes a lot more informative and a lot more industrially used than the complicated numerical solutions. So let's jump in. The finite element method, the way it works is that you take the you take your differential equation in your system, which is over a large geometry, and you break it down into small elements. So I'm going to show you a picture of what that looks like here, uh, which are which are a finite number of elements. Hence, finite element modeling is one of the implications. On each of these elements, in this case, it's these triangles here. Um, what you want to do is you want to approximate the actual solution with a simplified version. Right? Typically, we like to use polynomials because polynomials are easy. These are called the shape functions in the finite element method uh, linguistics. Um, they are not necessarily polynomials. Uh, but if they are polynomials, they are typically of a finite order. And that's the second application of what the finite and finite element method is. Okay? Um, note that the approximate solution will converge on the, ideally converge, on the real solution under two scenarios. Either we can increase the number of elements approaching infinity, which is our, our infinite basis. It is actually a, a system of basis expansions. Or we can get highly accurate solutions over each one of these elements. Both will approach the correct solution, the real solution. Um, the way that we're going to specify this and determine it mathematically is we're going to take on each one of those elements certain key parameters. So for a polynomial, you can imagine if we're doing a quadratic, we might want the value of the polynomial at three points. That would determine a quadratic. But you could also say the slope at one point and two other points, or at two slopes and the second derivative. All these different ways are different ways to specify that parabola. Uh, these determine the so-called degrees of freedom of the model. And that's actually going to be our main computational parameterization and hurdle. The more DOFs you have, Typically, the larger your problem is going to be and the more computationally expensive it's going to be solving. Okay? Note also that the finite element method doesn't actually solve the original equation. We modify it something, into something called the weak form. In ComSol, that's largely hidden from the users. Uh, if you are interested, then you should continue on in your studies until 3 and M4 when we are going to go through the weak form derivation and how the finite element method is actually implemented. Uh, but the important point there is that we don't need a continuous solution, a C2 continuous solution. So for example, Fourier heat transport is the second derivative of your temperature field, right? Well, the second, having that the second derivative is equal to some number assumes that it even exists. And if you have a piecewise element, a piecewise solution between two elements, then you don't actually necessarily have the existence of a second order derivative. Nonetheless, through the weak form, we can still find that solution in an approximate sense, in a mathematically robust and approximate sense. So that's the purpose of the weak form. Yeah. The process of breaking our geometry up into these finite elements of, uh, excuse me, into this finite collection of elements is actually highly complicated. 
It's a process known as meshing. You may have encountered it as tessellation. They're all kind of variations of the same idea of how you effectively do this. For this particular example, where we have a rectangle, it's kind of trivial. Um, triangles, or more generally, they're called simplices, or simplexes are, um, are the most easy to represent curved geometries. But you can imagine as we get into curved, contorted geometries, this gets more complicated. Certain physics applications, for example, CFD, this is going to be particularly important. And the type of mesh element and the shape and the meshing requirements becomes very important. Nonetheless, this allows us to be very general and flexible in our implementation. So meshing for parameterized geometries, curved deforming domains, mesh refinement, we can concentrate our mesh in certain areas in order to resolve features such as high temperature gradients, eddy currents, apart from the, uh, from the larger scale bulk. All this can be done and facilitated within the finite element method. It also allows for flexible implementation of material properties. I'll talk about that. For example, spatially dependent material properties. If you have thermal conductivity that's different here over here, you can put that in nicely and cleanly. You can put in all sorts of different boundary conditions in a very flexible form. And the finite element method just kind of makes it work, which is very nice. This could be contrasted to other methods of solving differential equations. For example, the finite difference method, which is a lot more restrictive and a more, more coupled to the types of geometries that you're using. What this means is that we can abstract. We have several layers of abstraction within the finite element method, and you're going to see that in console too. For example, we can abstract away meshing parameters. How much, how many elements do you want? What kind of resolution do you want? How do you want it concentrated in one position versus another one? Do you want triangles and rect or rectangles? It doesn't matter for the finite element method as long as it's consistent and as long as it's put into that framework. We can also do uh, inputs, for example, materials or models, uh, input properties, uh, the amount of time that you want to simulate, the, uh, the ambient temperature, things like that. Everything can be removed and abstracted from the whole. Uh, the geometries, this is another nice feature. We can define our model in a way that is dimensionally agnostic. So a lot of physics doesn't matter if it's going to be a 1D, 2D, or 3D. We can actually define that consistently within the finite element method and then go back and change that later without really changing anything else. And that, that's a very nice feature and a very powerful feature, especially when you run into computational limitations. Let's see. Physics are also can be uh, abstracted away. And what I mean by that is that the, the fact that you have heat transport doesn't care what material you have, as long as it's a solid. What the conductivity is, it doesn't matter at that point. You can define that you have heat transport. You can define your boundary conditions. You can define the tolerance on certain of these variables. It's not a problem. Uh, then you can go back and you can change the material. You can change your mesh refinement. You can change the dimension of your problem. Even. It's not really a problem. Um, Let's see, this allows us to use the black block solvers, and which means that we can do this model, uh, this class, before doing the numerical methods underneath it, which is very nice. Okay. Uh, similarly, the mathematical engine underneath is common and can be abstracted. So this works off basically solving linear systems. As we'll talk about in numerical methods, it all boils down to linear systems. There's a great meme about that. Um, all that is hidden from you which is very nice. All the wiring is done. All of it is done correctly. It's all tied in correctly, and it all just works, which is very nice. Uh, we can also change the types of studies that we want to do. So we've got heat transport. We've got our geometry. We've got our parameters. Are we going to look at a stationary solution? Are we going to look at a transient solution? Are we going to look at uh, eigenvalue analysis, frequency domain? Any of these, it doesn't matter up until that point. So we define the problem, we define our materials, and then we just pick and choose what kind of study we want to do with that. Very nice, right? Next up is the results. We go into the results and we visualize it. Which one do you want to visualize? Do you want to look at your stationary or transient? Do you want to do stationary and then transient and then look at the result? All this can be done, and then we can go back and we can change things and we can compare our results and even compare the different results at different one of the last things that's very useful is parameterization or like data analysis or meta analysis of these models. Say we, we are not sure what spacing we want to use between two elements. We can set it up to run a parameter sweep. So it runs the model once, records a solution twice, three times, four times, hundred times. Let's vary 
three different dimensions. Let's do different sampling algorithms. All that's there and sits on top of the model. So again, very nice. Similarly with optimization, we can find the optimal according to some kind of metric. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so on and so forth. One final nice thing is that the, the codes, actually this is a benefit for console. So I'm gonna stop there and we'll continue with our next video, which is gonna be an introduction into how console actually works.